wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin as-salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh So tonight inshallah we'll be moving forward we'll be moving forward by Allah's permission to chapter number 37 of Riyadh as-Salihin باب الانفاق مما يحب ومن الجيد no way may allah have mercy on a soul says باب الانفاق the chapter of spending مما يحب يعني المنفق from that which the spender loves and is fond of the charitable one spending from that which is close to you and dear to you and near to you so giving from that which you yourself would take and receive وَمِنَ الْجَيِّدِ And giving from that which is of fine quality. بَابُ الْإِنْفَاقِ يَعْنِي وُجُوبُ الْإِنْفَاقِ اِسْتِحْبَابُ الْإِنْفَاقِ الْحَثْ وَالْتَرْغِيبُ عَلَى الْإِنْفَاقِ الْتَرْغِيبُ فِي الْإِنْفَاقِ The inspiration, the encouragement, the incitement, the push, the pull, the obligation, the recommendation of spending in general. And spending out of that which is near to you. Tafaddal. That's nice. I take it off my back. This is my drone right here. Don't get it twisted. I had it for years. It's a rare model edition. Blah, 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 blah. But you like it? No, oh, it's cool shape. Not a... Bismillah. And deep down inside, I'm like, damn. But, Bismillah. I want you, my brother, who's pleased by it, and inshallah, you didn't put the iron on me. Dang, that joint crazy. <laughs> La, and FYI for those who are watching in different states, different cities, let alone different countries, in Philly, a joint is anything. In Arabic, a joint is a ayn, shay, anything. It could be a woman, it could be a man, a dude, a, a thing, a, that, that, joint, that joint was wild. It could be an event, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I may have, you know, lost some of my Philly vernacular. Ah, ah. You watch yourself shake. Ah, <laughs> quick, quick on the jaw, huh? Ain't nothing slick to a can of grease. Ah, uh, vernacular. Thayyip, you memorized that book yet? I know. Thayyip. So, a John is a, it's anything, whatever you want it to be, right? Am I right or wrong about this? Okay? A person, a place, an event. Oh, man, I just, man, that drone was crazy, man. I just left. Right? Etc. So, a brother, he sees something that he likes, and inshallah, he doesn't put the ayin. MashaAllah. La quwwata illa billah. Allah mubarak. That's nice, mashallah. Whether he wants it or not, he says, Father, go ahead. And this may be my favorite thing. My favorite tea thing or teacup or whatever. Right? Giving out of that which you feel a connection and an attachment to. And obviously that's a sign and that's a mark. That's a sign and that's a mark. Whether you're giving it to someone or they're giving it in the cause of Allah, general charity, that's a sign and that's a mark. That inshallah, Allah is more beloved. Pleasing Allah means more to you than your own personal desires. To see your brother rocking it, to see your brother looking nice, go ahead, you got it, shake. I'd rather you shine instead of me. That's inshallah, that's a what? That's a mark of goodness. You've explained before, and we all know about thanks to your brother and how that is a stipulation of iman. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, you can't believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself, right? And how Allah Azza wa Jal, he describes the Sahaba in the Quran. He talks about the Ansar and the Muhajireen. And he mentions is that they give precedence to their brothers, to their brethren. There were those who migrated from Mecca and other places to Medina. And then there were the indigenous inhabitants of Medina. They were there first. Their migrant brothers came to them and they, whatever you need, whatever you want, it's yours. They give precedence to their brothers, even though it's something that they like or they're fond of. And that's, that's what we said, that's a sign. Inshallah, of love of Allah, and that's also a sign of wanting better for your brother. I'd rather you have it than me. Wahakada. 
And of course, this is universally applied as well to knowledge. Naam. As Imam Shafi'i Rahimahullah Ta'ala said, I'd rather, he said, I'd prefer that all of this knowledge was stated by somebody else. I'd rather it was never on my tongue. Meaning, as long as the people get the information, the people get the benefit, I don't have to be involved. The egotism, right? Being caught up, and I have to be the one to say it. I have to be the one to give it. I have to be the one to declare it. It doesn't matter. Whoever is bringing the beneficial, hardcore knowledge from Kitab and Sunnah, Fadl, you got it. I'm not going to stay in your way. I'm not going to hate on you. I'm not going to heckle you at your show. All that magic trick was fake on the front row. You go ahead and perform the magic trick for the people. What's important is I'm not going to come to your show trying to play you. If you're spitting that which is real, you're giving the real beneficial stuff, go ahead. So giving precedence to others, right? And that's a long discussion. What's important is chapter 37 is talking about money. Primarily spending out of good money, good wealth. When you give zakah, you don't give the leanest, skinniest, weakest, gimpiest sheep or lamb on its last leg. Nor do you have to give the fattest, fluffiest, wooliest sheep or lamb in the middle. But if you gave that big, fat, fluffy sheep, that's better for you. And that shows, inshallah, as a mark and a sign that you have respect for Allah's laws, His rules, and that you want to offer Allah the best. Right? So zakah, sadaqah, etc. Right? And that's applicable secondarily to anything else. Spending your time. You gave a brother five minutes, but you know if you needed something, you would be nah, just five minutes. Right? You told the brother no, but if you needed something, you would feel some type of way. I got a question. I can't help you. Sorry. Q&A is over. Khalas. I can't, I can't, they can't mess with you. That's not in fact. He spin. Go ahead. After the q and I'm tired, it's late, I answer the question, go ahead. In fact, you spin, spinning your muscles, right? How would you feel if you needed someone to help you carry something or protection or whatever the case may be? You be there. You say, you tell a brother, look, I need, a, I need an animal. Ah, the sheep, right? Hey, man, it's supposed to be what? It's supposed to be done. Ah, inshallah, let me know. Cash app, Zell, lie. You need the sheep, it's cut. The neck is cut, shake. When you need to pick it up, rather, when can I drop it off? Unlike some, what? <laughs> some brothers from amongst us, without mentioning no names. <laughs> I told you, Sheikh, don't mess with me. <laughs> he was grinding me up the other day. Yeah. <laughs> he said I was daif. <laughs> Which is true. <laughs> That's not a lie, but <laughs> I told you I was going to have some jabs for you, Sheikh. Right or wrong? <laughs> I'm the left. I didn't, right? Yeah. You knew what was coming. What's important is, <clears throat> is that spending and being generous means many things. That's the point. All jokes aside. Whether it's your knowledge, you're generous with, your time, your strength, your name, your clout, putting in a good word for somebody, he's trying to get married, trying to go overseas. Yeah, I know him. Go ahead. Oh, really? He's, he's from your end? Class, done. You spend from that which you yourself would want and like. And not spend, not to give that which you yourself were like, ugh. And that's, that's it's manifested in many, many examples, right? People that give things to eat that they wouldn't themselves wouldn't eat. They wouldn't eat it. Not I have a preference, I have an advanced palate, but it, the food themselves they it will make their stomach turn and they give that for iftar. A brother needs sadaqa, you give him five dollars. Knowing that five dollars is going to take you where? What's that? What you going to buy on five dollars? Ten dollars? Twenty dollars? You get the point I'm trying to make, All right? So you give out of that which you yourself would what? Would take that which is jayid. And this chapter, before we get into explanation, also shows us the importance of quality and how we don't need whether it's from the west or the east or the north or the south. We don't need foreign outside influences outside of Islam to tell us, the Muslims, about the importance of quality. And this is another sad reality of the Muslims today. The standards of hotels, of transportation, of customer service, etc. And the lands of the Muslims, in most cases, are the most lacking. And the lands of the Kuffar are the what? You find the best quality. And the Prophet Wasallam, he told us, Allah told us about quality over 1,400 years ago, the importance of offering the best, right? Khayran, inshallah. All right. So before we get started, uh, it's a book. I was doing some moving, some cleaning, 
and some rearranging from my mess, my hoard, my messy stuff. If you guys saw how messy I was, you probably wouldn't take knowledge from me. Uh, I don't know how long I'm going to you don't. What's important is I came across this book that I bought a couple of years ago, maybe more than a couple of years ago, rather, it's maybe like eight years ago, on a sidewalk. A sidewalk vendor was selling these books. And uh, I picked up the book, <clears throat> and I thought it was very interesting. And I happened to have the book with me. And I'll show you guys really quickly before we get into the class. Some images, some artifacts, some maps. Very interesting. A contemporary lacquer chest produced in Mexico. The Cherokee Rose, originating in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? The name of this book is called 1421. I'm sure many of you brothers have seen it before or read it online, 1421. And it says, the year China discovered America. Now, and the reason why I'm showing you this book, like I said, I happen to have the book with me. It made me think about um, a very interesting statement of a wise man. A wise man once said, even though we never did it, is that he who controls the past controls the future. He who controls the past controls the future. And what's meant by that, or what I understand from that, is that he who controls the narrative of the past. History. This is what happened. We were the first. We did it first. We discovered it. We conquered it. We were the original inhabitants. We patented it, et cetera. We established this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So once I have the lock, the key, the chain on the past, I can now tell you what you can and cannot, what you should and should not be doing in the future, the present and the immediate future. So therefore, I was the founder of this masjid. So therefore, you have to obey me, listen to me, give me everything, because I was here first. If I can control that narrative, whether it's true or false, but if I'm in control of that, I'm going to have control over the future. My people were the first to uh, inhabit th these lands. Right? I was the first one to rock this. you never seen nobody rocking a, the joints like I was rocking them. So therefore, anybody that comes afterwards, we're in them is biting off me. Got to pay me homage, right? I was the first person to graduate. These were the first Muslims in this country. These were the people who discovered these lands. So therefore, they have the most right to them. And everyone else from another country is an immigrant, is an alien, is a foreigner, and not a real, true American. Except, you get the point I'm trying to make? So whether the Chinese discovered... America, the New World, the Americas, North, Central, South, the Caribbean, whether they discovered it before 1492, the Colombian theory, Columbus, etc., or not, is not the point. The point is this book, among many other books, shows you is that there are other theories out there. And there's scholastic evidence for those theories, whether you agree or disagree, let alone this theory is superior than that one. So if you realize that there are other theories out there, and there's other evidence, other research, etc., it leads you to see that these people or this one lied to me or misled me, or only what they, they call it the sin of omission, right? They didn't lie to you, but they omitted it, right, etc. So when you realize these different uh, books and these different works out there, you understand history versus his story. Because if we say we conquered it first, we were here first, we landed first, Everything other than after that is downhill. Slaves, servants, right? There's a colony, et cetera, et cetera, versus, whoa, wait a second. According to your theory, there were people that went there 70 years before you did, let alone people who contest this theory. Whatever country they were from, Muslim or non-Muslim, say we were there first, et cetera. So you get the point I'm trying to make? Okay, so that theory of 1492 and Columbus and the Caribbean, and South America, and Central America, etc. It's a long discussion, which we're not here to talk about. It's a very long discussion, and it's a very important discussion for Muslims. And there are many consequences and ramifications that come from the validity or the lack of validity of 1492. And it also goes to show you some lessons that Muslims can take with regards to uh, vision and open-mindedness. And if the Muslims had only went west, and we know some of them did according to certain theories, but if they only, there's no doubt Columbus came. It's, that's a fact. And there's no doubt his discovery or his landing was one of, if not the most impactful to this day, whether he was the first or not. 
like these scholars talk about. Whether he was the first or not, but his landing was what? No doubt about it. Changed the game forever. So it makes you ask the question, what were the Muslims doing and why didn't they travel and sail west and establish? If they did sail west before Columbus, during the same time, shortly afterwards, why didn't and why couldn't Islam and the Muslims have colonized the New World and spread Islam and made Islam the dominant religion and made the Arabic language the language of an entire continent, an entire hemisphere? And if you think about it, what was going on in the 15th century at the time in the Muslim world? Who were the leaders? Who was in power? 15th century. From 1400 to 1499. Who, who were the names? Who were the people in control? Who were the caliphs? Who were the real players of the Muslim world? Where was their navy or their navies? Did they have money? Were they lack, were low on funds? Why didn't they what? Sail west. Like the European countries did what? Sailed west. Did they sail west before Columbus? With Columbus? After Columbus? But why didn't, why wasn't the flag planted? Like, no doubt about it, they did. So these are very important questions, whether you're a revert to Islam, you adopted a foreign religion, an alien religion, an Arab religion, whether you were born and raised Muslim, Muslims are terrorists, Muslims are immigrants, Muslims are this, Muslims are that, Muslims are that. When you read the history, you say, oh, slow down now. Let's talk about who's the terrorist, who's bloodthirsty, who raped, who pillaged, what was religion used for, so on and so forth. And now many, many arguments, they spring forth from this discussion. Who was the first? Was it the Vikings? Was it the Chinese? Was it the West African Muslims? Was it this? Was it that one? Was it Columbus, etc.? Who named the first? Who did what? So this is a very interesting book, um, full of information, full of facts. And obviously the author in this work, he concludes, is that they came over 70 years before Columbus. Right? So just imagine how many other books are out there, how many other theories are out there. Imagine how many other lies and inaccuracies your teachers told you. And they didn't realize they were lies because they were fed, they were fed, and they were fed, etc. Talking about smashing the tahut, right? The false idol, the false deity, breaking it, shattering it into pieces, splinters. And that's oftentimes a lie. There's no different in Islam with regards to different theories, the different groups, the different ideologies. They say we were the first. We, this is the orthodox. This was here first, then the people. When you go back, you read the history, say, slow down now. That's not true. Until the fourth century, it didn't exist. Until the eighth century, there was no such thing as that. No one even talked like that. No one even spoke like that, etc. Right? So it's nothing more beneficial than digging in the crates, as we say. Digging in the crates. Reading the books. And just because you read a book, it doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything in the book. It doesn't mean that everything's right. It doesn't mean that everything in this book I agree with but it's going to broaden your mind. It's going to expand your mind, and it's going to lead you to more thirst and more hunger for the absolute truth by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you get a chance, check it out. It's very, very, very interesting work. There lies no doubt you'll at least walk away with something from this work. Wallahu alam. All right, let's get down to business. <clears throat> so, no we may Allah have mercy upon him. He states, Qala Allah ta'ala, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ وَقَالَ تَعَالَى يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْفِقُوا مِنْ طَيِّبَاتِ مَا كَسَبْتُمْ وَمِمَّا أَخْرَجْنَا لَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا تَيَمَّمُوا الْخَبِيثَ مِنْهُ تُنْفِقُونَ الآية. He quotes two verses from the Qur'an. The first is from Surah Ali Imran. Allah says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ You'll never achieve piety, true piety, until you spin from that which you are fond of. You'll never be a true believer until you give up some of what you love, until it hurts you and pains you on the inside, but you let go for Allah's sake. That's when you reach the pinnacle of Iman. Next ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, O you who believe, ya ayyuhaladheena amanu, He commands them to spend, anfiqu, min tayyibati ma kasabatum wa mimma akhrajna lakum min al-ard. Allah says, spend the good things, spend from the good things that we've provided you with. And it's, that in itself is a lecture. That one part of the verse. Spin from the good things we have provided you with. Allah doesn't say spin everything. But it says min, from, some of it. Tayyibat, find pure, lofty things that we have lent you and given to you on consignment. We have handed you. 
It's not your money. It's not your wealth. You didn't make it. You didn't earn it from your strength or your skills or your knowledge or your good looks. We have provided you with those good things, and we've made you the trustees of those fine possessions for a period of time. And as the law says in other verses, and the law will see what you do. It will make you the successor in the land, and you will see how you behave. Now it's your turn. It's easy to criticize. He's a bad ruler. He's a bad imam. He's a corrupt ruler. He's a this. He's weak. He's such and such. He's such and such. He's such and such. Fuggle. The show is yours now. Let's see what you're going to do. Let's see how you're going to behave. Let's see what you're going to change. Let's see what's going to be your imprint, your legacy, etc. So that, that in itself is a lecture. The balagha, the Arabic language, the eloquence of the Arabic language. Allah says, spin from the tayyibat that we have given you. And this verse, Allah says, ma kasebatum, from that which you have earned. So Allah says, well, and from that which we have allowed to come forth from the earth for you. How many crops are there? If I ask you right now, Sheikh, how many types of potatoes there are? Beans, fruits, vegetables, plants, herbs, teas. How many flowers? All of that is included in from that which we have We have allowed to come forth from the earth let alone natural gas, right? Gold, silver, huh? the different ores, the minerals, all of the things that the modern world runs off of. Just think about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلَا تَيَمَّمُ الْخَبِيثِ يَعْنِي لَا تَقْسِدُ الْخَبِيثِ Don't look after, don't go towards, don't intend that which is low, and that which is base, and that which is foul. Don't spin that which you yourself would turn away from or turn your stomach, make you frown. Don't, 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 don't stick your hand towards that which isn't the best. Spin out of that which is quality. So both of these verses clearly show what the chapter heading has stated. The obligation and the virtue of spending in Allah's cause and giving from that which you yourself are pleased with and that which you love and you're fond of. And there are many other ayat as well in the Quran and Kareem regarding that. The first hadith, no, he says, on Anas and Radilawan, who called her, Kana Mutalata, Akthar al Ansari bin Medina Timalan, Min Nakhlin, Wakana Ahabu Amali Hilehi, Beiru Ha, Wakanat Mustak Bilatan Masjid, Wakana Rasulullah, Sulla Salami Ad Huluha, Wayash Rabu Min Matin Fiha Tayyib, Kala Anas, Falama Nazarat Hadi Hil Aya. لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ قام أبو طلحة إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال يا رسول الله أن الله تعالى أنزل عليك لن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ وإن أحب مالي إلي بيرحا وإنها صدقة لله تعالى أرجو برها وذخرها عند الله تعالى فضعها يا رسول الله حيث أراك الله فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بخن ذلك مال رابح ذلك مال رابح وقد سمعت ما قلت وإني أرى أن تجعلها في الأقربين فقال أبو طلحة أفعل يا رسول الله فقسمها أبو طلحة في أقاربه وبني عمه متفق عليه وقوله مال رابح رمي في الصحيحين رابح ورايح بالباء الموحدة وبالياء المثنى أي رايح عليك نفعه بيرحا حديقة نخل وروي بكسر الباء وفتحها So uh, he mentioned just one hadith and that's the famous narration of Abu Talha May Allah be pleased with him The narration of Anas about Abu Talha Abu Talha Anas says he was the biggest farmer in Medina. He had the most palm trees, most date palm trees. He owned the biggest patches and pieces of land, the plantations of date palm trees in the whole of Medina, Abu Talha. Uh, and the fondest piece of land that he had, the thing that he loved the most, that was the best, fondest to him, was something called Beiruha, which was basically a well. And it could have been a well and a garden in which there was a well, a nice little spot, an oasis. Huh? 
that was in front of the masjid. And the Messenger of Allah would frequent this little oasis. He would always go in, sit down, relax, and drink sweet, cool water from this well. He would take shade, he would relax, he would sit in this uh, Bayruha. So uh, Anas says, is that when the previously mentioned verse from Surah Ali Imran was sent down, verse 92, you'll never obtain piety until you spend from that which you love. When that verse was sent down, Abu Talha radiallahu anhu, he stood up. O Messenger of Allah, he cried out, Indeed Allah has sent down that verse upon you. You will never attain piety until you spin from that which you love. He said, and uh, this uh, place, Bayruha, this well, this little section, is the best, it's the finest of my wealth. It's the thing that I love the most. I'm finest of them. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm the most fond of this thing, of this place. He says, and from now on, I declare it to be charity in the cause of Allah. It's out my hands. Khalas. It's gone. He says, Arju birraha wa dhukraha in the Allah Ta'ala. He says, and I hope that I shall receive its reward and its benefit from Allah. That's why I'm giving it up. That's why I'm donating it. Fadaha ya Rasulullah haytha arak Allah. O Messenger of Allah, you take this garden and you spend it, you donate it, you use it as Allah has shown you. You are in control of it right now. The Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, Bakhin, which is an Arabic expression, which can mean many things in our language, our culture, like, man, which, like, Bakhin, like, that's right, my man, as we would say, right? He says, Dalika malun rabih. He says, that's successful wealth. That is successful wealth. Arayah. He says, that's money, that's wealth that's going to flow. It's going to keep moving. That's a, a power move, as we would say. That's major. That's, uh, that's major, no doubt. That's a strong move on the board. Right? We say, huh? Good move. Nah? Good move. That's a strong move that you just made. And then, the Messenger of Allah, he said, and I've heard, he says, I hear what you say. He says, But I think on the contrary. Instead of donating it to me, donate it to your relatives. Give it to your family members. Give it to your close ones. Give it to those who share your blood. Abu Talha, who he complied immediately. He said, O Messenger of Allah, that's exactly what I'll do. And this what Allah says, فَقَصَمَهَا so he gave it to his family members and he gave it to his cousins, Bani Ammihi, the sons of his paternal uncle. And this hadith is collected by Imam al Bukhari and collected by Imam Muslim. As you can clearly see, this is a grand deluxe hadith. Tremendous narration of the Prophet. Uh, some years back when I was in San Diego, I did a full lecture just on this hadith, a detailed dis discussion on this one hadith. So inshallah, you guys can go back and check that out. The name of the lecture is called The Garden of Abu Talha, in which we went and dissected this hadith point by point. The main moral of the story is crystal clear. Abu Talha loved that garden like nothing or no one else. Allah sent down the revelation. He got rid of it. Reaching for the bir. You won't obtain bir until you spend and give up the thing that's the fondest to you. That's the connection between the chapter heading, those ayat, and the hadith. Everybody clear on that? Khair, inshallah. As far as the fawaid of this hadith, then there are two men in account. As we said, that's an entire lecture that we, lecture that we did just on this one hadith. Um, and from the benefits that we get from this, what I'll mention now is, this narration shows us the connection and the combination between the Quran and the Sunnah. And how the best way of interpreting the Qur'an after the Qur'an itself is with the sunnah of the Prophet And it's a physical example of how the Prophet taught his companions and he gave them tarbiyah. He nurtured them. And nurturing doesn't always mean pieces of information or words. But oftentimes the nurturing is through action, the teachings, the holistic teachings. Right? And this hadith also goes to show us the virtue of Abu Talha. 
He was a righteous companion. And the companions, when they heard the revelation, it was, you know what I mean? Unfortunately, a little different than us, right? Inshallah, tomorrow, next week, come check me out. I'm a little messed up right now. Shake. I'm gripping right now. That's nice, mashallah. When they heard it, they did what? They acted. They immediately ran to translating the theory into deeds. Allah sends down the revelation, and they took it. This hadith also goes to show us is that the asal, the default of all things in Quran and Sunnah, the default is the zahir, is that which is apparent, until proven otherwise. Tafsir or ta'weed or majaz is figurative, it means this it is a different explanation that has to be what? proven and that the starting point in the Quran was sunnah is what outwardly states in the Quran and sunnah you cannot believe until you spin from that which you love Abu Talha he did what? he immediately spent that which was the most beloved thing to him this hadith also goes to show us <clears throat> another version of Abu Talha Whereas he immediately obeyed and listened to the Prophet ﷺ. He heard what Allah said. He implemented what he understood. And the Prophet ﷺ, as I just said, explained to him something that was better. He gave him an interpretation after he implemented that which was apparent. Give it to your family members. And it doesn't even take the text away from its apparent meaning. Rather, it's just a type of taqeed. It's restricting or making something explicit which is inexplicit. Spend from that which we have given you. Spend from that which you love. And the best spending is with your family member, at, with your family members, as we've explained before, right? And this hadith also goes to show how the imam, the leader, it is his job to show the people and to teach the people that which is best. To give them the best. So when it comes to asking a question, seeking a fatwa, you give them the best. They seek advice, you give them the best. What you have done is very commendable, meritous act, but I think you should give it to your family members first. And this also shows us the humility of the Prophet He was humble, whereas he clearly said, Inni, ara, I see. And he could have just said, listen to me, follow me. But he says, I humbly suggest that you do such and such and such and such, right? Khair inshallah. Last but not least, the last thing I will mention is this hadith goes to show and it goes to prove the permissibility of eating and drinking fine things. And that eating and drinking fine things is not a means of extravagance. It is not being a spendthrift or being greedy for the dunya. And to be close to Allah, you don't have to be hungry and starving. And obviously, if you're seeking closeness to Allah through intentional starvation, an intentional consumption of low-grade, low-quality bad things, then the shaitan has clearly deceived you. If you're in the cause of Allah, and all we have is this hard, crusty bread, that's a different story. We're seeking knowledge, all we have is this water that's not the best water, that's a different story. You're on the battlefield, that's a different story. Versus I'm going to intentionally eat something which is of bad, low, poor quality and say I'm going to get closer to Allah. I'm going to intentionally avoid this fresh food because that's from the dunya. I'm going to intentionally starve myself and I'm going to get closer to Allah. That's, that's, that's a problem. So the Prophet Sallallahu he would enter the garden, he would sit down and he would drink. And Anas said that the water was what? Tayyib. Nice, fresh, clean water. Not like people who drink brown water, muddy water, thinking and feeling that that's getting them closer to Allah. Spiritual steroids. Bid'ah. Innovation. That's, that's what it basically is. In eight months, I can get this big, I can work out, versus two weeks or two months. And I'm speeding up the process, the hormones, whatever, to get me bigger, faster, stronger, quicker. And bid'ah is an act of ibadah, that the one who performs it or makes it intends good by. He wants to get, to, he wants to get close to Allah. But it's going to get him closer to Allah faster, quicker, stronger, because the normal natural way isn't good enough. Right? So that's, that's extremely dangerous. And that's misguidance from Shaitan. And the Prophet Wasallam, he enjoyed things that were lawful. He enjoyed things that were tayyib. And from that was the water found in Abu Talha's garden. Wallahu ta'ala alam. 
Khair and Shalat, many, many, many other fawaid as well, which we don't have time to get into. You can go back to that full lecture. We'll stop here tonight, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, um, and we'll try to save some time for the questions before Salat al-Isha. Wallahu ta'ala alam.